Good evening, beloved. I hope and pray that you have prayed and you've hoped for yourself, for your neighbors, your neighborhood, and the world that is around us, for truly our world, our neighbors, ourselves, our neighborhoods are in need of prayer. I'm going to get right to uh, my primary point this evening. I promised South Central Church of Christ that I would give a response to the national uh, indignation, the national uproar, uh, the uh, issues around the police uh, officers fear to remove his knee from the neck of uh, a unarmed African-American male, George Floyd, in Minneapolis, uh, the treating him as though he were subhuman. And those who were with him that, uh, although there is this silence, I'm understanding, or this code of blue, some code between police officers that should have been a code of dignity, a manhood, a plain humanness that would not have allowed them to stand there while this man was dying. And the insensitivity and the madness that has taken place among many who are posting videos demonstrating, quote unquote, that he could not have died that way and other things that are said that just defy uh, the mind's c capability of, of how a human being could look at a human being that way. But what it does do is show us the reality of life. And certainly I'm on Facebook and I read all of the, not all, but I read so much of the rage the anger, the disappointment, the heartache. And I read things on there that said, I've had enough. I have a African-American son. I'm an African-American male. We've paid our dues. We've been in this country 400 years, and yet we still are being treated as though we were treated when we were slaves. We were treated as subhuman then, and that's continuing to happen. And people are crying out on the different social uh, outlets. Let me live. I'm, I'm, I just simply want to live and praying to God to help me live. God, let me live. I want to express the joy. I want to express the creativity. I want to express all that I have as a human being, not only while I'm a young male, but while I get older and become an older male. I want to be an elder in the community. I want to make a difference. I want to be the best husband or the best athlete or the best musician or the best uh, a statistician, the best scientist, uh, politician, uh, 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 whatever religious leader that whatever is available for me in life, they're crying out, I, I want that so bad. And, uh, and I want to be able to be a part of the, the beauty of building uh, uh, black women and to 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 continue to be the uh, and to grow and to be an example for them of what God can do with a man, but not only that to be a part of a hum of the human race. Beyond all of the differences, the false differences, and all of the other things, to be able to uh, be so empowered by. Son, the S O N D R, that is the ability to look at human beings and to empathize with and recognize that every human being is living a life that's complex. Everybody is overwhelmed. Everybody has been programmed by this world to see and to think and to become everything but what God has created us to be. So we are wanting to be more in tune with that which is from God that allows us to look beyond all of the exteriors and all of the different categories. And it takes a lifetime, but we want to be human beings above all. 
So no matter whether you're male or female, no matter what your ethnicity and all of the other stuff, just to live, to drink the coldest water and enjoy it, to drink sweet tea or unsweetened tea, uh, to enjoy the meals that are prepared and, and the ones that you learn how to cook and, and, and to enjoy scientific achievement and to enjoy uh, all of the things that God has called us in creation. And I want to start off by sharing this particular uh, passage. Jesus, in, in Luke chapter uh, 4, uh, starting in verse 14, listen. Jesus returned to Galilee and the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found a place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has appointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to, uh, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue was fastened on him. Notice, notice what Jesus says. The spirit of the Lord is on me. He's anointed me to proclaim the gospel, the good news, to the poor. Jesus came as a manifestation of God's will for the marginalized, the poor. And he came not just for the economically poor, but for all of those who are on the bottom. Everything just about in the, in, in the Bible, Old and, and New Testament, is about how God deals with mankind, his creation, but how he lifts up those who are downtrodden. The Bible has been misused, and there are those who baffle me that they say they wear the name Christ, but they oppress people, which is the opposite of what Christ came for. He made his mission clear. And there are those who try to spiritualize the Bible to say he doesn't mean literally or economically poor. It means something else spiritually, but he does mean economically poor as well as spiritual. We shouldn't be trying to make those differences. If he came to ensure that the captives are set free, not only were they imprisoned physically, but emotionally, psychologically, religiously, and all that encompasses us as human beings. So Christ Jesus came to set us free. Now, the proverb writer tells us, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. For the rights of all who are destitute, speak up, judge fairly, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. That's Proverbs 31, 8 through 9. Proverbs 22, 22 to 23 says, Do not exploit the poor because they are poor, and do not crush the needy in court. For the Lord will take up their case. And will exact life for life. Isaiah 1 17. Learn to do what is right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Isaiah 10 1 through 3. Woe to those who make unjust laws, to those who issue oppressive decrees to deprive the poor of their rights and withhold justice from the oppressed of my people, making widows 
their prey and robbing the fatherless. What will you do on the day of reckoning when disaster comes from afar? To whom will you run and ask for help? Where will you leave your riches? Isaiah 10, 1 through 3. While America is in an uproar, legitimately so, it is truly not just black people, African Americans, but people who seek justice are in an uproar. People who look beyond <coughs> and have learned life recognize that no one should want to live with this type of injustice, that our lives are precious and that every human being is a part of life and how you treat one is a, is a definite indication of how you treat all. No matter how you try to distinguish one person from the other, you say, I have this deep love for my people, this deep love for my family, but how you treat them really carries over as to how you treat others. If you love your family, of course there's that type of love, but then you have compassion and a mercy and a copy for others. What's the point in not doing so? What do we gain as an individual not loving God's creation? For God so loved the world. God created man. He did not create different races. He did not create all of this. He created Adam and Eve. You say, well, Brother Dublin, in, 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 in the Tower of Babel, yes, but I'm talking about in the garden, he created a human being and another human being, and he put into motion his image in those two human beings, male and female. The rest of it is stuff we made up. There's no such thing as white people. There's no such thing as black people. We are different. We come from different backgrounds, different countries of origin throughout the history with everything different, but we are to have the commonality of being human beings. We laugh, we cry, we hurt, and we desire, we're angry, we're sad. Uh, uh, we, we, we have children and we lose those children and, and, and we cry and we grieve and we never get past it, let alone get over it. And we deal with life and we're heartbroken and we break hearts and we seek the religion and through spirituality a connectedness, connectedness to God. That's the human experience in one way or the other. So we have to be taught to hate, taught to dislike, taught and, and systematically reinforce that. So this, uh, while this is going on, while we're dealing with Minneapolis, a white woman and female, uh, a white female, was asked by a black male in New York to leash her dog in his park where the rules says the dog should be on leash. On leash. He's a bird watcher. And he just asked her. And she feels like she is going to get indignant, outrageous with him, tells him she will call the cops, call a police officer and say that an African-American male was threatening her and she felt intimidated. She's been fired from a job. She's apologized, but she weaponized that particular incident. She used the opportunity that could have been for great fellowship to, to and, and, and I think she's just part of the system. <clears throat> I think just we're taught to address issues and to address people rather based on what we see. Here was an African-American male, a bird watcher. And she weaponized the police officers by saying, I will make up something that's so believable. I, as a white female, will ensure that you, that the police will respond quickly and you pay the price. This man could have lost his life, very well could have lost his life. And I know through living through this and even for my grandchildren and great-grandchildren, even my sons today, that I tell them try to avoid any encounter with police officers that turns out to be negative. And I, I know that, especially the teenagers, they, they are, the grandchildren, they're young, I haven't done anything, you're not going to run over me. And I don't take that away from them, but I'm asking them to be wise. I want you to live long enough to become politicians, to be, become part of sororities and fraternities, 
and other community groups who's going to go out and make a change. I don't want you dying and become a martyr under these circumstances. So then we noticed that the white protesters who are about in North Carolina uh, reopened North Carolina, but you see them across the nation. And they're standing up on capital grounds across this nation with armory, with guns, with stuff that uh, I'm not even sure what those guns are. I don't know where, I don't even know how you would carry something that big. But they are allowed to do that, and a bird watcher is threatened with his life. So, I mean, what's wrong with that picture? But having said all of that, why I wanted to talk to you is this, this is the results of what has happened 400 years after slavery. Because everything we're dealing with comes from systematic issues, systematic um, racism, white supremacy. It's, it's One of my friends once told me, as an African-American, he had never experienced white supremacy. He didn't know anybody who said they were white supremacists. It's because it's systematic. You don't need to say it. Once you uh, diffuse a concept into a population, you don't walk around saying anything. It speaks for itself and reinforces itself over and over and over again. And it's supposed to be so, so much a part of that system that you can't put your hands on it, but you see the effects of it. So then there is this. Uh, lack of understanding when I read the social uh, uh, postings on Facebook and other things, that systematically, and no individual person is bigger than a system. So you've got to stop blaming uh, black folk and poor folk because they don't do certain things that the system has taken away from them. And there's no one that even tries to, to uh, look this up. There's no one who can do the research, and it's right there. You can find that it's not hidden, that will not know that we are impacted. Yes, there is personal responsibility, personal accountability. But even when African Americans are wealthy and they do well, they are still treated differently. So we're not talking just about wealth here, but we are talking about a systematic way of making sure that certain people are seen as less than human or less than others. It starts with the Naturalization Act of 1790. Now, I want to read something very briefly uh, from this act, and you can go on, uh, uh, you can Google it and you can find it. Uh, I love the work that PBS has done, and so I just go on uh, PBS, and there is this piece on the power of an illusion. First of all, I said half of the, of the title, Race, the Power of an Illusion. And it talks about uh, the, the race timeline. And for centuries, whites have benefited from the exclusionary laws and policies, while other groups were barred from citizenship, denied opportunities, and restricted from full participation in American society. So the 1790 Naturalization Act reserves naturalized citizenship for whites only. African Americans were not guaranteed citizenship until 1868. Non-whites were barred from testifying. In fact, Chief Justice J. Murray, Charles J. Murray remarks that Chinese are a race of people whom nature has marked as inferior so that this person who had testified against a white person, his testimony was thrown out because he was Chinese. But he's saying God has made them inferior. That was the thought not only about Chinese, but everybody who was not white. And we certainly know that we are called three quarters of a, of a man, uh, but that's, that's, that's not just us. That's the mindset. So that in the Dred Scott decision, the U.S. Supreme Court, Court upholds the Fugitive Slave Act and declared that Negroes, whether free or enslaved, are not citizens. 
As Chief, Chief Justice Taney put it, they have no rights which any white man is bound to respect. Free black people are taxed like whites, but they do not enjoy the same b benefits and privileges. Now, and, and I, I'm only trying to do in this little short clip something to get you going so that you won't just be angry and then throw your hands up and give in. That's a fight that has to be fought. But to get to where we are today, to be able to worship, uh, to be able to have the uh, education, the social economics, and the things we actually do have, they weren't given to us. That was a fight. That will always be a fight because the system does not transform itself. It doesn't change itself. It doesn't love. It doesn't show compassion. It doesn't show equity and equality. It's not designed that way. Even back during the civil rights movement, with all of the work that went into this by blacks and whites, uh, religious and non-religious, it turns out that when it went through court, it ended up that the white female benefit from civil rights more than anybody's. We really kind of got duped, thinking that it would uh, the civil rights would help to elevate all people. Even that was twisted because White females were considered the minority compared to white males. So then they turn around and rather than doing what is right by other people, the, the, the economics and all that would have benefited others went to white females. And I'm saying that fight and that battle is ongoing. Under the current administration, over 200 federal judges with lifetime appointments have been uh, put into place, and many of them are not qualified, but they have a particular agenda. They come out of a particular school of thought, and they are going to wreak havoc for generations to come. And, 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 and so, so the battle and the fight is always there. But I, I want to also remind you of uh, this uh, report from the Center for American Progress, you can go on, on, on Google, Center for American uh, Progress. And some of the highlights that they had given was that African Americans own approximately one-tenth of the wealth of white Americans. In 2016, the median wealth for non-retired black households, 25 years old and older, was less than one-tenth of that of similarly situated white households. The black-white wealth gap has not recovered from the Great Recession in 2007. Immediately before the Great Recession, the median wealth of blacks was nearly 14% of that of whites. Although black wealth increased at a faster rate than whites in 2016, blacks still owned, that, owned less than 10% of white wealth at the median. Now, I only gave you just a couple of things. I'm not trying to be comprehensive here. My goal is to get you to think that all of the institutions, the banking system is not set up for poor people. It's not. It is set up to protect the rich people. Law enforcement and police came into being not to protect the community. It was to protect the filthy rich, that they had private police officers that later became a part of government and, and, and much used much broader. But they aren't set up historically to protect poor people. It's never been that way. All of the things that have happened has come because there was a fight for justice, fight for what is right. And the church then has had as its, as its a driving force what Jesus has already said and what the whole Old Testament and New Testament talks about. God wants social justice. And yes, there are some people following the, the, the European model that says social justice, Jesus and all of that is, is not in the scripture. That's because they don't want to see it because now you've got to act like Christ. So if you don't act like Christ, you can just go to church and we can be exactly like we are now. 
rich white churches across town who could give a hoot about a lot of people in the community, certainly don't care anything about black churches and working together. Of course you have exceptions, but everybody knows that's our reality. And because of that, Christ gets dishonored because that is not what he represents. But we mirror in our churches our systematic racism and supremacy and the suppression of other people exactly like the people in the world. We're supposed to be different than people in the world. But having said all of that, I do not concern myself about that. Let the people do what they need to do. What I'm concerned about is when we get upset, what do we do about it? What organizations and agencies come together, what churches come together and deal with these issues on a local level? And although it's systematic, if we work together in every local community, nobody trying to take credit for anything. That's hard to do because human behavior is selfish, period. But having a bigger picture, how many churches work with social organizations and others to send us kids to school? How many are working to enhance what we have to make sure that those who don't go to college can get a different kind of education? What does an 18, 19, or 20-year-old kid that smokes too much dope, gets into trouble, where is his prodigal place where he goes to so he can have redemption? So rather than blaming the parent and blaming everybody else or killing them or locking them up so they don't continue this pipeline to prison, where are the intervention tools? Where are the, the people who are, who are aggravated, agitated, worn out on Facebook? But where are you going to be next week? What are you doing? What does your church do? What are we going to do? What is the specific plan? Because you cannot overcome systematic uh, racism, white supremacy. You cannot overcome the things that we have dealt with. And we cannot overcome the, even the negative demeaning thinking that African Americans, many African Americans have. And, and, and by thinking, well, we need to stop killing each other. Let me tell you something. If you really meant that, you would do your research. It's dishonorable to sit around talking about we ought to stop killing each other. Every ethnic group in the world always kill more people among itself than anybody else. Since creation, there's never been a group of people who kill more folk outside. That's because of locality. That's because of proximity. And that's because of economic conditions. That's the way it is any place in the world. So why don't we look for bringing about the conditions through education and economic empowerment and spiritual growth and development where there will be less of a desire to do such a thing. Well, people can get beyond where they are now and get beyond the things that hinder them and take away their life. And the last thing I want to say to the church, I, I, I just, it, you know, whether you're on Facebook or not, let's stop talking about, well, black people hate each other. And if we stop hating each other, we got 40 million people at least and we don't all hate each other. We're not all doing negative stuff. We aren't all doing it. We are all in this system. And anytime you spread that, you're not spreading anything that comes from black people. If you just stop and think about it, we're in the world spiritually with that kind of thinking. It, it can't come from Jesus. It comes from the system. And so the system actually uses people who mean well, but they are not really thinking about what you're saying. We're human beings. We're not a homogeneous group that everybody has one mindset. We didn't all come from one, con uh, we came from one continent historically, but we didn't come from the, the same tribes. And, and as, although we've been here, we have different thoughts about everything, and we shouldn't be called to be able to have one mindset. And if you have a leader and he dies, then you can't do anything. We're quite capable. We're made in God's image. But we need to come together and not just talk about it. And everybody has their own forum. But what about inviting the community and listening to the community and come up with a plan that goes beyond the community so that you begin to implement? Learn from different pastors and preachers and different social movements. Reverend Barber with his moral Mondays, look at 
how they get out there and get in the people's face. They go to court. They do all the other things. Why aren't we doing things like that? We can do it. We can enhance what they're doing, and then we can do broader and greater things. So I just want to share with you that in spite of everything that has taken place, we are created in the image of God. We're going to overcome not because of Dr. King. We love his work, but because Jesus came to set the captives free. Jesus came to give us life, to give us life abundantly, and there is no race of people, no ethnic group that can have dominion over our great salvation and who we are and whose we are. We must make sure that our congregations are on fire for the Lord and that we're working together and there is no pettiness hindering the work. When it rises up, we got to put, put it out and make sure that we are implementing for our young people the greatest learning programs, the greatest educational programs about God, about the power and the mystery of God, and preparing them to live. And it's on us then to take control of the situation that God already has laid out for us, and we can depend on him. God bless you, but remember that that blessing must be used for somebody else. Don't you dare continue to live selfishly as though the money that God has uh, given you stewardship, your time and ability, your talents, all of that was given for the common good so that you can look like uh, Jesus did at the rich young rule and love him. And you can look at the boy with his pants down and all of the other stuff you see and love them because as a human, you are God's everything and you re represent him in everything that you do. Look, let's get busy. Stop criticizing. Stop crying. Let's get busy. Let's go to work.